Karen was full of fun and full of life. Karen was only a, a child herself at the age of 20 and five months pregnant. We were extremely happy about the fact that she was having a baby. Karen was so thrilled about it. It was just something we were all looking forward to. What happened to Karen just doesn't happen every day. She's obviously got in a car with someone and it's all gone wrong from there. Karen could possibly have been Malat's first victim. He murdered seven backpackers in the 1990s. Australia's most notorious killer. Malat is a psychopath. He is a textbook psychopath. But Ivan Malat had even darker secrets. This is the untold story of Ivan Malat. Now, two of Australia's top criminal investigators asked the question, were the Belangelo Seven Malat's only murders? Dozens of other victims, many more killing fields. This is going to shock a lot of people. Where are his other hunting grounds? How many more did he kill? This is a horrifying list of potential victims. It's staggering, isn't it? This is the deepest anyone has ever dug into Ivan Malat's killing ground. It got away with murder. It's like it was swept under the rug. He's learning. Serial killers learn their craft. And they're brought to a place where nobody would hear them scream. I just knew something wasn't right. They disappear. I said, what? Shot or stabbed to death. This fits exactly with Malat. It's heartbreaking. I struggle with this. I have no doubt there are more victims. The main question is, how many more? It's very eerie. It was in February 1971 that Karen Rowland was murdered and her body was left right here in this pine forest in Canberra. 20 years of age and five months pregnant, exactly 50 years on, and nobody has been charged with her murder. And I do believe that Ivan Latt is responsible for Karen Rowland's murder and that she was probably his very first murder victim. 20 years before, the seven backpackers were murdered in the Belangelo State Forest. And I'm certain that Ivan Malat is responsible for many more murders. Criminal psychologist Tim Watson Munro has delved into the minds of Australia's most depraved criminals. From tycoons to terrorists, underworld gangsters, and the notorious Hoddle Street killer. I've assessed approximately 30,000 offenders, serial killers, mass murderers, rapists. I've dealt with many psychopaths, tens of thousands of them. Forensic anthropologist and criminologist Dr. Xanthi Mallet is world renowned for digging up new clues in old cases. I specialise in reinvestigating cold cases and I've worked with police forces across Australia. We have this interest in unsolved crimes, psychopaths, what it is that drives people. They plan to uncover the new murders, the new victims of Ivan Malat. We're convinced that Malat is responsible for many other crimes and we're going to prove it. We know that there are more victims out there, and one of the cases I've followed very closely is Karen Rowland. I'm Steve Rowland. I'm Karen Rowland's brother. Karen was my biggest sister. She always got on with everyone. 
just really happy, friendly, loving person. She was tragically murdered 50 years ago. And we still, to this date, have no idea as to why or, or what has happened. Karen Rowland went missing one night after running out of fuel on the streets of Canberra. A young woman robbed of her life, not to mention the life of the unborn baby. And her body wasn't found until three months later in a nearby pine forest, with pine needles scattered over her remains. Exactly like Malat's other victims. Steve, her brother, and the rest of the family have been waiting over 50 years for answers. We've been, I wouldn't say let down, but I think we've just been avoided, perhaps. I'd really love to see the, the case to be revisited in today's terms rather than, than how it was done 50 years ago. We need to know why and how. I mean, it's something that's just got to be done. I've been given a lot of help by Hugh, who is my cousin who lives in Wales. He's the driving force that's helped reignite the case to try and find out what did happen to Karen. I live in Aberystwyth, Mid Wales coast, right on the far west side of the United Kingdom. I was in the police force for 30 years. About 22 of those years was as a detective. I worked an awful lot within crime intelligence. I was involved directly in a dozen homicide investigations. I've been studying Karen's case closely, I would say for certainly the last three years, but I've had a general interest in it for the last 30 years. Words can't describe how close it is and how close the family and Karen's family are to my heart. I'm not convinced that Karen's case has ever been fully reviewed. My investigations of the murder have been limited. Uh, having any form of an investigation of a case that's 11,000 miles away is extremely difficult. We've been told nothing. The family have been told nothing. Karen Rowland's family has spent decades waiting for answers, and sadly, they aren't the only ones. I believe that Karen's death is one of many other murders by Ivan Malat, including innocent young travellers from all over the world. Like Lydia Knotts, the 21-year-old German backpacker who disappeared in Brisbane in 1976 and 22-year-old American backpacker Barbara Brown, who vanished whilst hitchhiking from Sydney in 1978. 15 and 16-year-old Tony Kavanagh and Kay Doherty, who disappeared from a bus stop in 1979. Annika Adrianson and Alan Fox, young hitchhikers who also went missing in 1979. And Peter Letcher, 18 years old, hitchhiking in 1987, later found murdered. Young mother, Diane Panaccio, who was murdered in 1991. 20 lives taken, possibly more. From Karen in 1971 right through to the early 1990s, this is a horrifying list of potential victims. 20 years of serial killing and Malak wasn't convicted of any of them. He's a marauding serial killer, uh, but he's an opportunist as well. He's working with main roads on job sites, driving up and down the Hume Highway. Wherever Malat seems to be working or travelling, women and men are disappearing and being killed. Malat's favourite hunting ground was the Hume Highway between Western Sydney and the Belangelo State Forest. From the late 1980s, he prowled this stretch of highway preying on young, vulnerable travellers. It was the, the age of, you know, Crocodile Dundee and Paul Hogan. The soapies were really having a big impact on UK TV. 
Australia was getting a lot of coverage in international media as a safe haven, a happy place. British and international backpackers came to Australia in search of adventure. It was a, a great place to get away from mum and dad. It's hard to know where to start. Caroline was the youngest of our three children. Caring, happy, thoughtful, a great sense of fun. Um, it was never short of laughter when she was around. We were very pleased uh, when we heard she was going to Australia because so many of her friends had been and come back and sung its praises. Caroline Clark and Joanne Waters flew to Australia separately. They didn't know each other before they arrived here, but they met each other uh, while living in backpacker hostels and going to bars, and, and that's when they forged a very strong friendship. These girls had no fear about hitchhiking. They, they'd hitchhiked uh, you know, on a number of occasions in the past and felt quite safe about it. They eventually left on that April day in 1992. They caught a train out to Kasula, and their intention was then to go to the Hume Highway and start hitching on the Hume Highway and uh, get down to the southern part of New South Wales. Joanne and Caroline would ring home every week. They would send postcards to their families on a regular basis to say what they were doing and where they were going and suddenly all that communication had stopped. When she missed Emma, our daughter's birthday at the beginning of May, that really did start to ring alarm bells. Our car phone rang and it was our policeman that was looking after us. He just said, he just said, pull into the side of the road. I've got bad news. And that's when we knew. The bodies of Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters were found in the Bulangalo State Forest. It was certainly by far the biggest investigation that I have ever been involved in. Chief Superintendent Clive Small handed one of Australia's biggest murder investigations. About 51 detectives were attached to the backpacker investigation team. A task force was formed. 300 police drafted into the search. We can do it, and we will do it. There was always a lot of speculation about how many more bodies were going to be found. Two have been found dead, and there are mounting police fears. This site could turn into a backpacker's graveyard. The backpackers came from the UK, Germany, and a few from Australia, and that gave it a huge international impact. Six international tourists have gone missing in Australia, including two British girls. German hitchhiker Simone Schmidl. Polish police have in a wild. Two other Germans, Gabor Neugebauer and Anja Habschi. Six and seven of serial murders. There was something about the murder of visitors to our country which uh, really seemed to touch a nerve in the Australian psyche that. Uh, you know, Australians see themselves as friendly and welcoming, and yet here we were killing our guests. Covered with branches and leaf litter, the bodies had been there for almost four years. The first murder was of an Australian couple in December 1989, just before New Year's Eve, and the last murder was in Easter 1992. 
uh, the British pair, Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. Ivor Milat wanted people who could go missing and not be reported missing uh, for some time. He wanted to make sure that most of his victims didn't have relatives or close friends in Australia who would report their disappearance within a few days. The seven young victims were either shot or stabbed to death, and not just with one shot, not with just one knife wound. Stabbed in the lower back, gagged, blindfolded, and shot 10 times in the head. These were uh, attacks which were brutal. Berlanglo Forest is a very eerie place at the best of times. When you go deep into the forest, you realize how vulnerable these people were. There was no escape. And you think about what must have gone through their minds before they were killed. Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters were the first to be found, although they were the last ones killed. Found here in September 1992. And it took searchers another year to find the bodies of James Gibson and Deborah Everest. They went missing in 1989, but were not found until 1993. And a month later, the police found the remains of German backpacker Simon Schmidl, who disappeared in 1991. And the other German backpackers, Anja Habschied and Gabor Nugabar, they went missing in 1991 and were discovered in 1993. You can see Malat's pattern. All the bodies were left pretty close to fire trails so that he could drive them to a certain point. I think the only way we're going to get a real sense of what it was like to be there is to go to Malat's killing field. All the bodies are within three and a half kilometre radius of this point. Remote bushland, pine plantations, not too far from the road. Easy for him to find, but um, very difficult for people to stumble across. We're actually at the memorial for the seven known victims. You've got to wonder what the likelihood is that we found all of Malat's victims. I've no doubt there are more victims because it goes back certainly to about 1971 and that gives us another 18 years in terms of his um, operating period. So in terms of the actual location of the Belangelo 7, we know that they're all buried in very similar circumstances. Just off fire trails, say between three and 500 metres, not exactly buried, but kind of in depressions, shallow graves covered in leaf litter. An attempt to cover them, but not so much that he couldn't come back later. And I think the reason for that is because he wants to spend time there and enjoy what he's doing. And they're brought to a place where nobody would hear them scream. So down here is the turn off to the grave sites for Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. Joanne Walters' body was found just close to the rock. And then Caroline Clark was found just slightly this way, about 30 metres away. Mm. You can only imagine the terror that Joanne and Caroline were experiencing as they're being led up here by Malat. This is the clearing. Both girls were found, you know, the shallow depressions that we've been talking about all, all kind of hidden by the log. And these logs act as a perfect marker for him. Mm -hmm with the rock as a marker from the road. Yeah, yeah. And he obviously wanted to spend quite a lot of time here. You know, he wanted to come back even, you know, months, even a year later. Well, they found empty alcohol containers, 
cigarette butts. They found 0.22 casings from a Ruger. He clearly came back and he enjoyed the experience, savouring his kills. It's staggering, isn't it? He's a true psychopath who has no remorse, no empathy. He would have enjoyed the power, the control, and watching them suffer because he's a sadist. It would be living hell. If you think how dense it is and, you know, how remote, it's, it's extraordinary that they were found at all. Totally extraordinary. And even though we found seven, the main question is, how many more? Suspect has emerged in the backpacker killings. Police in Australia are questioning a 49-year-old man in connection with the murder of seven backpackers. Ivan Malat was accused of killing seven backpackers between December 1989 and April 1992. In March 1996, Ivan Milat stood trial for the seven backpacker murders and the abduction of British man Paul Onions. Families of the international victims, like the Clarks, flew from the other side of the world to see this man brought to justice. There were nine counts on which he was being tried and we knew that if he was found guilty on the first one, that we were home and dry. We knew if we got that first guilty, that we were okay. The clerks remained in court, listening as the prosecution led sensational new evidence against Ivan Milat. It just kept coming through, guilty, 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 all nine. We'd got him. Cruel killer of seven young tourists will spend the rest of his life in jail. Australia's worst serial killer. When Malat was convicted of the seven killings, he went to jail. The police stopped investigating the other crimes that he could have been responsible for. They hoped that he might make a confession. He didn't. And the bastard got away with it. There are a number of cases that he may have been involved in. It would be lovely to pin those on him and give comfort to those poor parents who have been waiting decades to find what happened to their loved ones. And we know what a torment it was for us. But uh, I, I just feel so deeply for all those who still don't know. No one has ever been held accountable for taking Karen and a baby's life. And that's the bit that we would dearly love to know. 20 years before the Belangelo murders, Karen Rowland was killed in Canberra. Did her murder match Malat's MO? What happened on that summer's day in 1971? Wanted number 36 opening, take one. The Crime Hunt, made in cooperation with the police in which you become a television detective. In Wanted tonight, we have two most intriguing mysteries. The first concerns this girl, Karen Rowlands, who vanished in Canberra late last February and whose body was found nearly three months later. How did Karen die? On Karen's last day, Karen had gone to work then she'd been out to uh, have her hair done. She was in great spirits, like really good spirits. And then my sisters, Chris and Karen, um, were going out then that evening to, uh, to a hotel. Then it just all went wrong from there. 
It was sort of on the spur of the moment that she planned to go back to uh, Canberra. She met up with his sister and her sister's fiance and the friend uh, at about quarter past nine. Uh, and then she headed off ahead of the other three. They went in one car, she was in her mini. They travel down Parks Way and Karen's has run out of fuel. Chris and John um, have continued on. It was then, I believe, they've noticed that Karen wasn't behind and, and they waited and waited and waited and then thought it's probably just best if they went home. It was just up here that she ran out of petrol. Yeah. 50 years ago, there'd be no traffic. She hasn't got a mobile phone, obviously, so she can't call anyone. She's vulnerable. She's 20 years of age. She's five months pregnant. So she's basically stuck here, no fuel. It's 9 o'clock at night. It's dark. There are no street lights. You know, she's either going to walk down the road in the dark or she's going to have to accept a lift. You've got no options, really. And uh, a person turns up in a car, offers a lift. And of course, 50 years ago, people were far more trusting. And we know that there were at least three witnesses that saw this. So we've got the first witness sees her getting out of the car, so obviously she's run out of petrol. A second witness sees her walking towards the back of a dark vehicle. And then we've got a third witness that actually sees the driver of that vehicle leaning over to let her in. All she'd be thinking about is getting out of here uh, because it's dangerous. That's the irony. She hops into a very dangerous situation to get away from one. I think Karen trusted everyone. Someone's come along, she's thought that maybe this person can help me out with fuel or whatever. I mean, wrong place, wrong time, and I'm sure that's what's happened with Karen. So this is the route that they probably would have taken if they were heading to the closest petrol station that would have been open at this time. Now, so as we approach the memorial, Karen would have been expecting to turn left, but instead, we think, that they turn right. Yeah, so it's about this point she's starting to wonder what's going on, I suspect, and starting to panic. And, uh... So at some point, she realises something's wrong, because we've got a witness that says that they saw a woman in a car and she was screaming. The possible last known sighting of Karen was reports of the gun gates at Duntroon uh, running from a car. They saw a dark colored sedan car on the grass verge on the opposite side of the road to which it should be facing. And they describe a young girl fitting Karen's description running from the car back in towards Canberra. That might well have been the last time Karen was seen. Karen was missing straight away. We knew it was out of character. We told the police, yes, they did find the car, but there was no forensic work, there was nothing. It was traumatic for mum and dad in particular, and we, we almost immediately started searching. Where is Karen, you know? Have you seen this girl? We had no idea for three months as to what had happened to her. It's about six pieces of fate, the coincidences, there's so many of them. And I can just go over in my mind, we all do at home saying, if only we hadn't such and such, if only we hadn't have been with her, you know, if only mum hadn't let her out. But it's no, you know, it's no good saying this because Karen's gone now, there's nothing we can do. This is how I mean, we have accepted it. It's uh, hard to get used to though.
The day that Karen was found, um, my uncle, Dad's brother, came into work to pick me up. Um, and when he, he come through the door, I knew why he was there. And, uh, yeah, he said, you better come home. And if nothing else, at, at least we knew. Karen's body was found approximately three months after her initial disappearance, and she was found in the pine plantation up near the Air Disaster Memorial, which is beyond Canberra Airport, heading towards Quinbian. strikes me is the similarity to the Belangalone. Isolated, and of course she was in a shallow grave covered by pine needles, as were the others. Yeah, and this fits his MO exactly. The mm. environment, the type of location, you know, very shallow grave, loose leaf litter, trying to cover the body but not burying because you want to come back, you want to relive that. So this fits exactly with, with Milat. I think possibly it's his first one. It's 20 years before the others. Mm -hmm. But he's built up to finessing his technique. So this might have been random. The next one's it's hitchhikers, and yeah. he becomes from an opportunist to a predator. There are certain similarities with regards to the area in which Karen was dumped and the, the area in which the backpackers were found. This was likely to be Malat's first victim. And he's learning, he learns his craft. Serial killers learn their craft. From the way Karen's body was found, she was about 16 feet from the road. She was in kind of a straight line as if she'd been dragged. Yes and there's clothing all over the place. There's been a lot of talk in relation to Ivan Milat having had something to do with Karen's murder. I can give a lot of reasons as to why it could be him. Uh, I can't find an answer as to why it isn't him. Witnesses suggests they've seen a dark-coloured car, and one of the witnesses claims that the car was maroon. There is a suggestion that Ivan Milat had access and was driving a Ford Fairmont, which was gold in colour. It's a dark-coloured gold that, in dim light, will appear maroon. Is there any chance that that was Ivan Milat's car that was in front of Karen? Can we rule it out? Tell me why it can't be Ivan Milat. Still to come. There is something not right. Another Milat victim is unearthed. A shallow grave, pine needles. That's heartbreaking. There's a bit of a pattern emerging here, this arc of evil. Karen Rowland's murder has never been officially linked to Ivan Milat. Her cousin Hugh has spent the last three years investigating her case from 17,000 kilometres away. He's kept an open mind about Karen's killer, but all paths keep leading back to Milat. 
I vividly remember in the late 90s sitting down with Jeff, Karen's father, when the Malat case was in court and saying to him, is there any chance that this guy could be responsible? With the work that I've done, I've found out that in 1994-95, Malat was considered a suspect in Karen's case, and yet the family didn't know that. The examination of the history and the records of Malat show that he was working in the area, so he had the opportunity, and uh, there was similarity between the future backpacker murders and her murder in terms of the way it was carried out and the body was left. Ivan Malat was 26 years old in February 1971, a killer in the making. 20 years later, another unsolved murder near Canberra, which also bore the distinctive mark of Malat. Diane Panaccio was killed in Bungendore in 1991. By then, Ivan Malat was 46 and at the peak of his murder spree. I'm Bill White, brother of Diane Panaccio. Uh, this is my wife, Vicky. Diane, or Dude, as we all called her, was outgoing sort of girl, very cheeky. She just loved life, loved people. Very happy, happy, happy always. And when you met her, you never forgot her. She was just a person you could never forget. She was just a beautiful person. A very loving mother. She did love that little Jack very much. And loved her husband. Jack was only two or three year old. And he was a wild little fella. <laughs> At the time, Vicky and I owned the Royal Hotel of Bungdor. That Friday night, Diane's husband, Carmen, told Diane, yeah, you go out and see Bill and Vic, and I'll stay home and babysit Jack and go out and enjoy yourself. We kicked back and had a few drinks. When it come closing time, she asked me if I'd drive her back to Queanbeyan. And Vic said, well, look, wait till we clean up. She said, I'll, I'll drive you back if you want. And she said, don't worry, I've got a lift back. I've got a ride. Apparently she didn't have a lift. And she went, walked up the road to the other hotel and she asked around the pub, is anyone going back to Queen Bear? But that's the last time we seen her when she was out the front. We didn't know she hadn't got home until Carmen rang us on the Monday. And when we got the call, we just knew something wasn't good. There was something not right. Carmen was Diane's husband. All he could really tell us was that um, she'd disappeared, was out of character for her, and he had no idea where she would be. Uh, initially, we kept a fairly open mind. We uh, conducted a fairly thorough investigation of looking for her. Of course, our hopes were that she was uh, OK. About three months later, in November 1991, two forestry workers were patrolling uh, the Talaganda State Forest, a dense pine forest between Bungendore and Queanbeyan. They located the remains of a female under a tree stump and covered in pine needles. It had already hit the news. And I seen it on the news as Bill pulled up from work. I said, Bill, come on, watch this. And as I said that, I looked out the window and seen the paddy wagon pull up in the driveway. I just knew something wasn't right. They'd found her in the forest. We told that she was strangled and stabbed with a, with a boning knife or something, they explained. And the, that a body was put in a, like a log and packed with pine needles.
Diane's death happened in September 1991. Between the killing of Simone Schmidl and the double murder of Gabor Neugebauer and Anya Habshi. So Malat was actively hunting at the time. After the break... Malat may have been in the hotel. The evidence is mounting. We were able to put two and two together and say this is a very, very strong suspect here. So this is actually one of the last places Diane was seen. The pub was owned by her brother and her sister-in-law, and uh, they were wanting her to stay the night. We know that she leaves the hotel at about midnight. Mm -hmm. She says she has a ride organised down at the next pub. There were some main road drinkers there. Malat, of course, worked for main roads at that time. When we did our first canvas on the Friday after she went missing, there were workers who had been working in the area uh, that day. Well, that may have been one of those people working at Bungador that day and had been in the hotel. Looking back, I believe that there's a strong possibility that Malat may have been in that hotel He may have seen her leave the hotel uh, or heard her asking for a lift home and volunteered to drive her home. You would never fear people, never feared anybody that anyone would do a harm. You know, she wouldn't fear to get into a car or get in with anyone. She just would never think that would hurt or harm her. So this is the last place she was seen alive. She's vulnerable, she's on her own. For a predator, that's mm. ideal. It was also raining, and so that may have been an added incentive for her to hop into a stranger's car. But we know that she got a lift with somebody because she's not found till two months later in a pine forest. Uh, a shallow grave, pine needles, uh, very similar to other people, including the last victims in Belangolo. And there's a bit of a pattern emerging here, this arc of evil. There's just a lot of different things that are kind of adding up to being very similar to Malat's MO. It wasn't until Malat came on the scene that we were able to put two and two together and say, this is a very, very strong suspect here. One of the things that Malat was renowned for was collecting souvenirs from his victims. We know that Diane had a gold chain on and also uh, some earrings and also some keys to the house. They were never found. The last time we spoke to police about Diane was 15 years ago. It was like it was swept under the rug. We never heard another thing about it. I'd like to see a result. But 29 years, and we don't know whether they've kept any DNA that they found on Diane or whether it's just been passed over and forgotten, I don't know. But to get an answer of who killed her, that's what I'll be looking for. It's heartbreaking. 
heartbreaking. All of the circumstances were similar to the Belangolo murders and gave cause for suspicion. However, there was not enough evidence there to implicate Ivan Milat. In hindsight, and, and everything that I've seen, on a scale of one to 10, I would say that there was a 9.5 chance of Malat being responsible for uh, Diane Panaccio's murder. There was one murder that Ivan wasn't charged with, but which I believe he committed. That was late 87, where I believe he murdered Peter Letcher. Peter Letcher was murdered just before the Belangolo killings began. He was on his way home from visiting his girlfriend in Sydney when he accepted a lift from his killer. Peter was repeatedly shot and stabbed. And the crime had all the hallmarks of Ivan Milat. The tragedy for his family is that no one has ever been charged with his murder. Peter Letcher was just 18 years old when he disappeared in 1987 from Busby, which is close to Liverpool, one of Malat's known haunts. And he left the city and hitchhiked his way home, and he was going to Bathurst as his final destination. But he never made it. Somewhere along the highway, hitchhiking presumably, he's picked up in a car, presumably Malat's, and a detour is made along one of these roads to the Janolan Caves. He's found three months later in the Janolan State Forest, the height of summer. Peter had been shot several times in the head, five times, I believe it was, and a number of bullets were also found in the ground around him. They were 22 bullets. His body was suffering severe decomposition, but it had a lot of chilling similarities to the backpacker murders. He was found under branches. Uh, he'd been stabbed in the back. He'd been shot in the head, uh, with his head having been covered in a, in a manner very similar to Carolyn Clark's. Yes. It did have similarities to the backpackers in terms that the body was laid out on the ground in a bit of a hole. It had been covered by leaves and branches, but also the actual murder itself, the stabbing and the shooting. So who was Peter Letcher? Well, he grew up in Bathurst, one of four kids, and I've spoken to his father, Brian, who says that Peter was just a happy, normal little boy. But as he moved into his teenage years, apparently he fell in with a rough crowd and there's some suggestion he may have been involved with selling drugs. And that may have had something to do with his murder. If you look at the way that he was murdered and the place that he was murdered, it suggests that Milad has to be the number one suspect. Janolan State Forest is three hours drive west of Sydney across the rugged Blue Mountains. It's an isolated place, a dangerous place. Well, that, all he's got to do is drive down the highway and pick up innocent people, and they are captives. Out here, you're really vulnerable. Peter Letcher was only 18. You know, he's, he's just young, probably you know, a bit naive. Somebody just offers you a lift, you know, you're going to take it, aren't you? To save a few shillings. Yeah. He must have appeared pretty normal. You know, there's charming Ivan, and then there's the real Ivan, who's the cunning psychopath. And at some point, there's a switch. 
Can you imagine the terror? You're driving along, you think you're going Sydney to Bathurst, and suddenly the driver takes a detour into this. a pine forest. He has virtually total control over his victim. You're literally trapped, aren't you? And there's only a few responses at that point. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to fight your way out? Malat was a well-built guy, not that tall, but, you know, muscular, strong. And, you know, he leans down, pulls out a gun. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah. You can try and talk your way out of it. You're wondering whether you're going to be killed, whether you're going to be sexually abused, or both. Uh, you're now just buying time, praying for some sort of intervention, which is never going to come. It's very eerie. We should be pretty close to the spot. This should be probably about the spot. We're about 11 metres in from the road, which is where Peter's body was located. He was found in a shallow depression created by a tree having fallen over and the root system exposed a dip, covered in some loose leaf litter just from the forest floor. Obviously, pretty similar to some of the other situations we've seen. It's striking how similar it is to Belangelo. Same forest scenario. There's logs, there's a shallow grave. Not far from the fire trail and points of reference where Malat could come in and relive the experience. It's, it's also very similar to the crash memorial site in Canberra for Karen Rowland. The similarities really are extraordinary. When police went to search Ivan's employment records, they found that he was due to start work on that very road where Letcher was found the following Monday. Work colleagues of his speculated that Ivan would often scout out a job before they did it. They would talk about him just going off driving long distances often at night. And they, were, they were never sure exactly what he was doing, but they knew there was something mysterious going on. The coincidence is extraordinary, and this one's hard to go past. Peter Letcher died violently. His murder, strikingly similar to the Belangelo killings that would shock the world five years later. But police had no reason to suspect Ivan Milat for Peter's death. He just wasn't on their radar. They were convinced Peter was killed by local drug dealers in a dispute over money. So at the inquest into Peter's death, the coroner found he'd been shot five times in the head by personal persons unknown. But then comes Belangelo, and the police start thinking, remember the Peter Letcher case. Given all the similarities to the seven backpacker murders, they start wondering if Malat could be good for Peter Letcher's murder too. Police were pretty keen to, to link the Letcher murder to the backpacker murders, but they were asked not to do it during the trial because the prosecutor didn't want things to be confused. So as soon as the trial finished, they hot-footed it out there and conducted a search of the area. Police today continued their painstaking search of the Janolan State Forest. They didn't find anything more to add to the case against Malat. Without any fresh evidence from the crime scene, police hoped the 22 rifle that killed Peter could be linked to the one used by Malat at Belangelo. My name's Gerard Dutton, and I'm a sergeant in the Tasmania Police uh, Ballistic Section. But at the time of the backpacker murders, I was working for the New South Wales Police. Sergeant Gerard Dutton described to the backpacker jury how guns leave unique microscopic marks on fired bullets and cartridge cases. I believe that the evidence circumstantially uh, indicates Ivan Malat was responsible for Peter Letcher's death. 
I was involved in the backpacker case from the very start when they found the first two bodies in the Blanglo Forest. The bodies of Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters were found in bush graves. We found that Carolyn Clark had been shot 10 times in the head with a 22 caliber weapon. And we recovered seven bullets from inside her skull, as well as three bullets in the soil uh, where her head was lying at the scene. When Malat was arrested, Gerard took part in the search of his home on the outskirts of Sydney. Here, police made a breakthrough that would be crucial in convicting him. Hidden in a wall cavity in the front wall of Malat's house were some firearm components. I was very excited because I instantly recognised them as components of a Ruger 1022 rifle. When I sat down at the microscope with my test firings using Malat's breech bolt and compared it to the Clark murder cases, I, I distinctly remember the hairs on the back of my neck standing up straight because the evidence was irrefutable. They matched, which, which meant that that breech bolt was fitted to the murder gun. One of the things we would do in the ballistic section is, is compare the cartridge cases and bullets that we recovered to other unsolved shootings. Because sometimes we find that the same firearm had been used and we can link these crimes. After thinking about the types of graves we encountered in the Blangalo Forest, it threw my mind back to when I was a junior ballistics officer in the latter part of the 1980s. I went to a scene where Peter Letcher had been shot dead numerous times in the head. And the body was found secreted but not buried, covered with bush litter like branches, twigs and so on. Exactly like seven bodies that we found in the Blanglow Forest. Similar graves, sim similar location, similar savagery in the way that these people had been dispatched. Electra had been shot numerous times in the head from a 22 rifle. It's not usual with murder victims that we find them shot multiple times in the head. And the fact that Carolyn Clark had been shot 10 times and Gabor and Neugebauer six times, just those few circumstantial uh, indicators to me would suggest Ivan Malat was also responsible. And so I compared the Clark murder exhibits to all of our 22 caliber uh, unsolved crime exhibits in the section. But when Gerard carried out the ballistic comparison, he hit a brick wall. The Ruger 1022 was not used uh, to kill Peter Letcher, that was used to kill Carolyn Clark. That, that, that's definitive. It was a 22 caliber firearm. Whether it was a revolver, rifle, or, or a pistol, I, I don't know. But Ivan Malat owned a lot of firearms and did a lot of shooting. Whether it was another firearm owned by him, uh, I, I can't say. Gerard couldn't link Malat to Peter Letcher's murder weapon. Yet he still believes the murder was so similar to the Belangelo killings, especially Caroline Clark's, that he can only draw one conclusion. My belief is that Letcher uh, was most likely killed by Ivan Malat. It seems far-fetched to think that some other unknown person has killed Peter Letcher in such a similar fashion. But like so many other murders in which Malat was a suspect, the case was never solved. I'm quite confident, I'd say satisfied, that he killed Peter Letcher, but the evidence wasn't strong enough at the time to charge Ivan Malat with the murder. There just wasn't enough there and particularly given the other cases that were being worked on at the time, we wanted to ensure that there wasn't a disruption to them. I think there is a strong likelihood that Malat was involved in the murder of Peter Letcher. 
But as Ivan Milat had already been put away for life and convicted of the backpack of murders, it was felt there was very little point in reopening the case and prosecuting Ivan Milat again for the murder of Peter Letcher. So they decided to let it rest. In a moment... When I saw him, he was in full predatory mode. The one that got away. He jumped out, he grabbed the hammer from the tailgate, and I'd realised then there was going to be trouble. In the Janolan area, west of Sydney, the search for clues to Peter Letcher's fate continues. Our investigators are pursuing a lead that further implicates Ivan Malat in Peter's murder. There's little doubt that Malat was active in this area around the right time, because we have evidence from another British backpacker, Colin Powers, who was picked up by Malat in 1982. He managed to get out of Ivan Malat's car and basically escape. And that happened right here, only about 30 kilometres down the road from the forest where Peter Letcher's body was found. I came to Australia in 1982, and I'd just turned 21 years old. I came to Australia because I had a kind of wanderlust. At that age, I was kind of naive and gullible. I didn't really understand how dangerous it could be. I'd only been in Australia for 48 hours, and uh, I started hitchhiking then. So I was stood by the side of the road about 9 o'clock in the morning in Blackheath. And then suddenly a, a pickup truck came and uh, stopped for me. And when I went to uh, throw my backpack in the back of his vehicle, a fellow jumped out and said, uh, don't, no, don't do that, mate. Put it here in the cab because it's safer. And I thought that was bizarre because the, the back of the pickup truck was empty apart from a, a large masonry hammer. And when I saw it there, what went off in my head was, oh, this guy must be a bricklayer too. I got in and the driver told me, put your seatbelt on, mate. So I put my seatbelt on and then he said, he pointed over and he said, uh, put that button down. And I looked at him like, why would you want to tell that to an adult, anyone over 10 years old? And I looked at him in a quizzical way, and he said, we don't want you to fall out, mate. He said, how long have you been in Australia? And I said, I've only been here two days. And he said, who knows you're here? He didn't say, do you know anyone here? He said, who knows you're here? And I thought, what a strange question. And it, I said, well, well, I don't know anyone here in Australia. Suddenly he said, oh, I'm turning off here. So I said, well, I'm going to Cobar, so you can just drop me off. And instead of stopping, he continued down the road, maybe about four or 500 yards, driving slowly, looking in his, in his rear view mirror. And then uh, finally we stopped about 500 yards from, from the junction. And he said to me, uh, I'm going to go down to Janolan Forest. He said, uh, if you want to drive along, you're welcome to. And he said, uh, you can see some real Aussie wildlife. I looked at the map and it was exactly the wrong direction to go to Cobar. So I said to him, no, no, I'm, I'm not going there. And he quickly jumped out and ran around the back of his uh, vehicle. I didn't realize at the, at the time that he grabbed the hammer from the uh, tailgate and then he came round to the side. 
And I'd realized then that he had no reason to get out that vehicle. And if he got out the vehicle and came round, it was, there was going to be trouble. And it was that, just at that very moment, a long stream of traffic came down the road. Malat was looking over his shoulder at the passing traffic and looking at me, wanting to strike. And he couldn't do what he wanted to do. And as I walked away, I got about 20 foot away, and I heard him call out, hey, mate. And I looked back, and he was lounging against the tailgate of his truck with a very frustrated, kind of wolfish look on his face. And he said something like, look after yourself, mate. Years later, back home in England, Colin watched a documentary about the Belangelo killings and realised how close he came to being another victim of Ivan Milat. When I saw him, he was in full predatory mode. He saw hitchhikers as a, a kind of an exotic form of wildlife that migrated through his territory, and he could just knock them off for, for dirty thrills, for sport. Malat specifically told me he was going down into Nolan Forest to check his animal traps. And it was that very same Janolan forest where Peter Letcher was found, stabbed and shot repeatedly. It seems more than a coincidence. You know, I survived. Ivan Malat. <laughs> Ivan Milat took his terrible secrets to the grave. Just how many people he killed will never be known. As our investigation continues, the body count is mounting. So we have these three new cases where Milat is a really strong suspect. We have Karen Rowland, Diane Panaccio, and Peter Letcher. Ivan Milat could have killed many other young travellers, including British, Dutch, German and American backpackers whose fate is still unknown. For years, Milat's job as a road worker and interstate truck driver took him right around the country. That gave him the opportunity and knowledge of the areas where these victims disappeared. I think there's a pretty good chance that Malad has committed some other murders in particular. You've got to suppose that there may well be other bodies out there. So let's look at the possibilities. North of Sydney, we've got Alan Fox and his girlfriend, Anika Adrianson. Then we've got schoolgirl Michelle Pope and her boyfriend, Stephen Lapthorne. And then there's the American backpacker, Barbara Brown, and Annette Shirley Briffer. Further north, we've got Narelle Cox, who disappeared whilst hitchhiking from Grafton to Noosa Heads. And up in Queensland, there's three other potential victims. There's Lydia Knotts, the 21-year-old German backpacker, and the two friends, Robin Hoynville Bartram and Anita Cunningham, who disappeared whilst travelling from Melbourne to Bowen. And south of Sydney, in the Canberra region, we have Karen Rowland. Elizabeth Herford and Mary Bertram, but there's also Diane Panaccio. And not far on the south coast in Warilla, we have Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh, who disappeared in 1979. Now, this is a case that I feel is quite strong. My name's Kevin Doherty. I'm Kay Doherty's twin brother. We were born five minutes apart, actually. Kay looked... She would stand out in the crowd, probably because of her bright red hair. She had bright red hair. <laughs> it was pretty frizzy, I guess, or curly, whatever you want to call it. My hair was pretty similar back in them days. We sort of knew what each other were doing. We knew what each other were thinking at times. She was pretty quiet girl. She was, I reckon she was shy. 
She was more of a follower. She was never a leader. I know one thing I never forget, a memory, and she was scared of the dark. Even at that age, even if there was someone with her, she was scared of the dark. Kay was 15 years and nine months old when she disappeared, just over 41 years ago, actually. She was supposed to go babysitting on that night, and I was supposed to pick her up that night. And from there, everything just went south. Kay Doherty's companion on that night was Tony Kavanagh. She was 16, a fellow student of the local high school and the opposite of Kay. She was a little bit out there for her age. She's probably a little bit more mature than most kids at that time. At school, she was in trouble a lot. Tony, I don't like to say it, but it's the truth. Tony wanted to go to a disco in Wollongong. She had a boyfriend at the time. She asked all her friends. Her friends weren't allowed out. No one was allowed out after that. And she's asked Kay if she'd want to come around her place at night. Kay would have been easily led. So whatever Tony had in mind, wherever they were heading to, Tony was leading the way and Kay was just following. So Kay has gone over to Tony's house, supposedly to babysit, but Tony has different ideas. Yeah. She wants to go about 16 Ks to Wollongong to a disco to meet some boys. And she's talked Kay into going along for moral support. So it was right here at this bus stop, opposite the Warilla Grove Shopping Centre, on the 27th of July, 1979. They were never seen again. So this is literally the last place they were ever seen alive? Yes. They disappeared. I went around on my push bike around 9 o'clock, and to my despair, Tony's stepmother answered the door and virtually said to me, the girls have gone to the movies. She said, I just got home and the girls have gone to the movies. And I said, what? When I got home, I just said to mum, I said, Kay and Tony aren't there. And my mum just jumped up out of the seat and said, what? <laughs> From there, frantically, my mum started ringing all Kay's friends, parents and started asking, were any of them girls with Kay and Tony? So from there, things just snowballed. By then, it was getting close to midnight. Mum started panicking. I knew something bad had happened. The police station was not far, so Mum and Dad and myself, we walked around to the police station. The police were just... without putting them down too much, they were terrible. They just told Mum she was a runaway. So from that minute we walked in the station to, the, to when we left, they had classed my sister as a runaway and come back in 24, 48 hours, they virtually said. From there, my mum was heartbroken. Yeah, she was devastated. Mum went home. She left the front light on. That front light stayed on for years. Every night, she never turned that light off, hoping her daughter would come home. So, could Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh have been taken to Belangelo, like the seven backpackers? Well, Belangelo is just 75 kilometres up the Illawarra Highway. An easy drive, and Malat was known to be working in this area at the time. Bob Malat worked on the road gang at Kaima. Kaima is about 10 k south of where we live, and the main highway was Shell Harbour Road where the girls were last seen. So apparently, Bob Malat frequented Shell Harbour Road quite often. Police said this was his route, or he was known to be along that area. That's why they would have started investigating him, I guess. Line, slow. 
And then they started finding bodies in the Belangalo State Forest. Every time Mum heard something like that, she's up. And it's like, wow, is that my daughter? And then Ivan Milat was on the news virtually every second night. It was even before he was convicted. And then when they started talking about all the bones they were finding, well, Mum would jump out of her seat. I struggle with this. And I still struggle with it today. It absolutely ripped the heart and soul out of my mum. And I think what hurt most more than anything was mum and dad going to their grave not knowing, having no answers. Still to come. World experts. There are possible other dumping grounds. And revolutionary technology. You can see through the canopy. Provide vital new clues. Extraordinary technology. The disappearance of Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh is yet another unsolved case linked to serial killer Ivan Milat. Mysteries languishing in cold case files for years. Forgotten by everyone, except the grieving families. I was always just sitting, waiting, wondering and hoping. But I knew something wasn't right. And I knew, I knew I wasn't going to see my twin sister again. I really knew that. Mm. Serial killers are hard to catch. The first thing police do when they're investigating a murder is they look at the people who are around the person who has the motive and the opportunity. When you're looking for a serial killer, you don't really get to do that. The initial appearance was khaki to green type um, shorts, yeah. Well, I think there are a number of factors why these murders have remained unsolved for so long. Uh, firstly, Malat was a very lucky man. He got away with murder on at least two occasions and probably more, we suspect. We also have to remember that scientific assistance such as DNA wasn't quite so good in those days as it was uh, in later years. And also you didn't have the computer technology that they have now. The computer systems the police used in the early 1990s were quite simple, basically, and didn't give them the ability to cross-reference crimes and situations uh, as much as they could do now. These cold cases could finally be unlocked using today's technology. On the other side of the world, in the depths of a Canadian winter, an international expert in crime analysis joins the investigation. To search for links between Malat and the growing list of new victims. My name is Doug McGregor. I'm a geographic profiler in Ottawa, Canada. Geographic profiling looks at the spatial, temporal, environmental, and geographic elements of human behavior. Geoprofiling has really revolutionized policing methods because it allows them to really focus their investigations. It gives them better time management, uh, it makes it more resourceful, more efficient, uh, and it uses advanced software, which the police did not have at their disposal decades ago. In a serial murder investigation, we are looking for linkages between the offender and the victims. Some of the information that I am trying to gather is the employment history of the offender, uh, places where the offender has lived, uh, routes they commonly take, homes of friends or family, or any place that the offender routinely visits. In terms of the victims, I am looking for much the same information. Once I have this information, I input it into mapping software uh, and create maps that I can provide to law enforcement. Uh, and this software also uh, helps identify uh, trends, patterns, and clusters. Geographic profiling can assist 
in the Ivan Milat case uh, in identifying which possible victims could be associated with Ivan Milat and where those victims' bodies may be. Ivan Milat's seven known victims were found in Belanglo State Forest. That was his primary dumping ground. There are possible other body deposition sites that would likely have been the result of uh, an opportunistic crime, such as Peter Letcher, Diane Panaccio, or Karen Rowland. For a 50-year-old crime like Karen Rowland's murder, any fresh leads could help reignite the case. I was involved a lot in the searching. We walked for weeks and weeks and weeks. We walked down the coast, from Canberra to the coast and back. She was found in a pine plantation, the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong person. At the time, Karen's inquest heard four different theories of how she died. Suicide, septic abortion, drug overdose, or strangulation. Because she was killed in Canberra, the Australian Federal Police are responsible for Karen's case. Now, prompted by our investigation, they've agreed to take another look. This is uh, just some, some photos we found of, of Karen herself. Oh, what a beautiful young woman, eh? Such a tragedy. We're looking 50 years later at this point. What was the police theory at the time? The inquest listed four possible causes of death. Um, to me, there is one, and that is foul play. Mm -hmm. uh, no doubt about that. Did the coronial inquest name any potential suspects? No. So that's still it kind of open. What do we know about the father of Karen's baby? They were in a relationship, uh, and that relationship broke up, but uh, there was just nothing to indicate that he was the offender at the time. Can you rule Malat in or out? He certainly wasn't a suspect at the time. There's some un untested information, if you like, or some assertions that uh, he might have been a, a possibility. Certainly can't rule him in, can't rule him out. A world away in the frozen reaches of Canada, environmental profiler Doug McGregor has been hard at work on the Malat case. Using the latest profiling technology, he's searching for links between Australia's most notorious serial killer and a growing list of unsolved murders. Now, he's ready to report back with his findings. So maybe it's best to start with the three main victims. That would be Karen Rowland, Peter Letcher, and Diane Panaccio. What did you find out? Uh, looking first at Karen Rowland, there were many similar environmental markers to Malat's uh, later known victims, uh, which were found at Belanglo. Uh, she was found in a pine forest. She was found off of a trail covered in light debris. There were items strewn about the place. Some of her personal effects, uh, specifically jewelry, were missing. The difficulty with Karen Rowland's case was that there's uncertainty surrounding uh, Malat's whereabouts during that time. The other difficulty was that strangulation wasn't one of Ivan Malat's favored MOs in his later crimes. But because Karen Rowland's case happened quite a bit earlier, that MO may have evolved uh, and he may have refined it over time. In my opinion, it's worth uh, investigating Karen Rowland's case further, but 
it is, at this time, it is inconclusive as to whether he was definitively involved in her abduction and murder. So where does Diane Panaccio fit into all of this? Diane Panaccio's case resembles Malat's later known victims fairly closely. She was murdered shortly after Everest Gibson and Schmidl, which puts her kind of right in the middle of Ivan Malat's uh, serial murder spree. And the, the circumstances uh, of where she was found were very similar to that of those victims in Belanglo. She was found, again, in a, in a pine forest off a fire trail, partly unclothed. There were items strewn about the place. She had jewelry stolen, similar to Karen Rowland's case. And she was stabbed in the thoracic region of the spine, uh, which is very specific and was present in uh, six or seven of Ivan Malat's known victims. In my opinion, Dan Panaccio was a, a victim of Ivan Malat. Do you think Peter Letcher could be one of Malat's victims? Peter Letcher is very high on uh, potential victims of Ivan Malat. Again, the environment was very similar. It was a pine forest. It was just north of Belanglo, an extension of that same forested area. Uh, he was found off a fire trail, partly clothed, covered in debris, items strewn about the place. And Ivan Malat was familiar with Janolan State Forest. Ivan Malat was working in that area at the time. And he had previously visited the area on a leisurely basis as well. But I believe that Peter Letcher was an opportunistic crime, that Ivan Malat came across him, he picked him up, he pursued to abduct him and, uh, and murder him in Janolan State Forest. So you're saying Janolan then is maybe not where we should potentially look for other victims. So where would you suggest? In my opinion, uh, the search for more victims of Ivan Malat should uh, begin at Belanglo State Forest. Belanglo State Forest was Ivan Malat's sanctuary. He knew the area well, he was comfortable there, he visited it often. He had property um, in that area. He hunted there. And he was never caught at the time, so he had no reason to leave. Even for Doherty and Kavanaugh, if they were abducted by Malat, it's a straight shot over to Belangwa. So it is quite possible that Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanaugh were victims of Ivan Malat. Belangelo State Forest covers almost 4,000 hectares, a vast and remote killing ground for Ivan Malat. Searching for new burial sites here is extremely difficult. But the investigation is about to break new ground. Using a high-tech scanning system known as LiDAR to penetrate the dense trees and undergrowth. It's the first time Belangelo has ever been searched like this. What we did was talk to an environmental profiler. What he's done is look at where the known seven are located, the way the offender used space in that situation, and then has predicted the most likely areas to search. He's actually outlined these two areas as our priority search sites. Yep. So obviously you've got your drone here today. What what is the process of actually looking to see if there are any likely areas there? Right, so we're going to use uh, LiDAR technology. The way it works is by sending a beam of light to an object and then measuring the time, how long it takes for it to return. Does it then create like a 3D map of the topography? Exactly. So 
including trees and everything around, including topography, you get a 3D representation of that. So it's going to be quite densely forested in these areas. How is it going to cope with the actual foliage? The main functionality of LiDAR is that it can see through the canopy. You can actually remove all the vegetation from your scan and have a look at terrain only and see all the bumps, pits, and depression in very uh, high detail. So there's no disguise with this? No, no. hiding? No. If there's something there, we may find it. Exactly. If you look closely, you'll find it. The investigation is well underway with three very strong potential Malat victims. Karen Rowland, Peter Letcher and Diane Panaccio. Plus the two South Coast girls, Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh, who could have ended up at Belangelo as well. And Ivan Malat could be responsible for a long list of other unsolved murders. This is the deepest anyone has ever dug into Ivan Malat's killing ground. This is the deepest anyone has ever dug into Ivan Malat's killing ground. The new evidence revealing so many new victims of Ivan Malat. The evidence points to him. His murder spree began much earlier than anyone ever thought. This is where things did get started for him. The officers said, you girls were practice run. Are there more bodies in Belangelo? 20 years of serial killing. A very strong case. Malat definitely did it. More victims than anyone suspected. If you follow this trail... Look, you can actually see that. And the groundbreaking technology revealing for the first time what's below the ground. Police were flabbergasted. Knew something wasn't right. I genuinely believe this case could now be solved. Seven News presents Ivan Malat, Buried Secrets. Next Sunday, 7 o'clock on... This program contains material that could be distressing for some viewers. Mad or bad. Evil or insane. He was into sexual abuse and domination. Was this all part of the thrill? Hitchhikers, backpackers, young women. He saw something and he wanted to kill it. He was a serial killer. 30 years ago, in the remote Belangelo Forest, Australia's most infamous serial killer, Ivan Malat murdered seven young hitchhikers. Badly decomposed bodies. Seven young backpackers. Backpackers graveyard. Now, a search for new victims is underway. Even though we found seven, the question mark is, how many more? Criminologist Dr Xanthi Mallet and criminal psychologist Tim Watson Munro are convinced Malat killed many others, including Karen Rowland, Diane Panaccio, Peter Letcher, and possibly South Coast teenagers Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh. This is a horrifying list of potential victims. The hunt for Ivan Malat's buried secrets. I've no doubt there are more victims. Inside the mind of a true psychopath. Malat wanted to control everybody. The strange rituals. Stabbed in the back, shot in the head. One person was decapitated. The forbidden love. An incestuous relationship. You couldn't have been in the family without saying, what's going on here? The lucky survivors. He said, OK, girls, which one of you wants it first? Why he killed and killed again. This is where things really did get started for him. And an unforgettable twist. It was the second person. There's another serial killer out there. As police launch a search for new clues. This is going to shock a lot of people. And the true scale of Ivan Malat's crimes this will change everything. ...is finally laid bare.
Ivan Milat's killing ground is enormous. Almost 4,000 hectares of rugged bushland and dense pine forest. Searching for new burial sites here will be a huge challenge. But the investigation team has a secret weapon even the police don't have, a high-tech laser scanning system known as LIDAR. Dr Yuri Shendrick will systematically scour the forest using a customised drone. It's the first time it's been used here. So there's no disguise with this. If there's something there, we may find it. Geographic profiler Doug McGregor has identified two high priority areas for today's search. You can just see them circled in red here. So these are the ones that we're going to use the LIDAR technology to investigate today. All right, spinning. Take off. Taking off. How is it going to cope with the actual foliage? You can actually remove all the vegetation from your scan and see terrain only and see all the bumps, pits and depression Great. in very uh, high detail. Back in the lab, Dr Shendrick will create a detailed 3D image of the scanned zones, which can be sent to New South Wales Police for a new ground search. All the bodies are within three and a half kilometre radius at this point. But hopefully we'll find some more. Exactly. If you look closely, you'll find it. For years, Ivan Milat roamed the highways and back roads of New South Wales. picking up unsuspecting young travellers, raping, torturing and murdering them. Just when the killing started is a secret Malat took to his grave. But Tim and Xanthia are convinced it began way back in 1971 with Karen Rowland. So this is the first time you've been here? It is, in 50 years. In 50 years, yeah, wow. Steve Rowland's sister, Karen, was 20 years old and five months pregnant when she went missing in February 1971 after her car ran out of fuel. Her remains were found here three months later. An elderly woman was out walking at the Air Disaster Memorial approximately five miles from Canberra City. As she was walking through the forest land, she discovered a handbag, and 12 feet away, the decomposed body of a woman. Since then, there's been much speculation about her death, but no answers. We've got the hypothesis that, you know, it could have potentially been suicide. That was one of the causes of death. We're 17 k's from where Karen's car was found. You know, this is where you would choose to end your life. That just doesn't make sense. I don't buy that at all. No. I mean, you know, your car runs out of petrol. People hear screams. People see a woman running. And all of a sudden, she comes here of her own volition and ends her life. I just it's think it's nonsense. Impossible. Only way to get here is if somebody brought her here. Yeah. You know what strikes me? It's so Belangolo. The same pine trees, same sort of ambiance. You could hear a pin drop. Like most serial killers, Ivan Milat refined his technique, becoming more brazen and violent with each successive murder. So we think that 
Heron was his first victim, and it seemed to be quite an improvised crime, not very experienced. And what the post-mortem showed, interestingly, in her case, if I show you the hyoid bone, which is in the center of the throat, that was actually broken. So if you were to strangle somebody, put your hands around their throat, that's why it's often snapped. So half of that was recovered, half wasn't from the crime scene itself. And I've never seen that in anything other than a strangulation case. So if we look to the Belangelo victims, you know, we're seeing somebody who's really evolved in their MO, much more experienced than we see with Karen Rowland's offence. Well, he's had years to hone his craft yeah. to perfect his methodology. Joanne Walters was actually stabbed 14 times, once in the neck, four times in the chest, and nine times in the back. Millat actually incapacitated a number of his victims by stabbing them through the vertebral column and severing their spinal cord. Which would immobilise their legs, they'd be paralysed, they couldn't get away, and he could then play with them and torture them psychologically and physically. And, of course, in the case of Clark, he shot her ten times in the head, maybe for target practice. This is the sort of psychopath we're dealing with. I think all the murders during that period in the early 90s were conducted in the same manner. They all had a ritualistic element to them. One person was decapitated. You can see a stab wound passing right through. If that was inflicted first, well, she would have been quite uh, incapacitated. Their bodies were found with uh, cloth draped across their mouth. All the indications were that Malat had, if you like, played with their bodies for some time. It wasn't just get them to the, the forest and kill them and sh shoot them or stab them. He'd obviously spent some time there. And given the fact that he'd paralyzed them by cutting their spinal cord, it could well have happened over a period of 24 hours or more. He may have taken that amount of time to actually deliver the final shot or the final stab wound. How do you understand that? What's the mental makeup, the neurobiology of a psychopath who kills for no reason? Heredity? Circumstances of his upbringing? Or just a, an oddity? A one-off? A three-legged man? I don't know what makes his head like that but it's extraordinary. I believe that Malat was born evil. I really do. It's the classic example of nature and nurture. I think in his case, he was born bad, but also his family environment didn't help. To get a deeper insight into what so fundamentally shaped Ivan Milat's twisted mind, you need to wind back the clock to the 1950s. To a very different Australia. When Milat was growing up in a poor, dysfunctional family on the outskirts of Sydney. Not far from where he would later abduct his victims. Ivan had 13 brothers and sisters, so he came from a very large family. His parents were battlers. His dad was a migrant from Croatia. His mum was, uh, was an Anglo. And they grew up tough, and dad was a harsh disciplinarian. You know, when dad was angry, they'd all just run, and they'd be people would see them shooting out the windows and the doors and anything to get away from dad. His father, I think, found Ivan and one of his brothers particularly naughty because when Ivan was very young, like seven or eight, his father would discipline him by taking him and his brother out in the backyard, getting them to lie face down, putting his foot on the back of their necks and pressing down and then whipping them on the backs of their legs with a piece of 4B2 wood.
And I think that that played a role in Ivan's, I use the term development loosely, uh, as a human being. I think that it played a role in what Ivan Milat became as an adult. His mother was much kinder to the kids. She never saw any wrong in her kids. She never saw any wrong in Ivan. She fussed over them, if you like, and uh, she mollycoddled them to a certain extent. At a very early stage, Ivan started going off the rails. He uh, went to a couple of schools. He would wag off school constantly. He would have fights with other kids. Inside the police station, the sergeant explains the serious position they're in. He was a difficult boy, there's no doubt about it. And it wasn't long before his criminal activity started escalating. Uh, I think he left school around about the age of 14. Uh, he was soon involved in breaking and entering, stealing cars, that sort of thing. And it wasn't long before he was in the court. And behind bars. I knew he was on a one-way trip. <laughs> I knew that. It was just a matter of how long. He was going to kill somebody from the from the age of 10, I'd say. You know, it was built into him. He, he had a different psyche. He was a psychopath. And it, it just manifested itself with, you know, I can do anything. By 1971, he graduated to committing armed robberies with his brother Mick. And that spree of armed robberies they did became a fairly serious chain of crimes. Malat was really a series of contradictions. Neat, fastidious, plight to others, a control freak, loved his family, literally, and yet would explode in rage. He was sadistic and cruel. And he was chameleon-like. He could blend into the community and get away with it until he was caught. Coming up, Malat's bizarre love life. They did have an incestuous relationship. What pushed him over the edge? He didn't react well to this. And a brave survivor. He said, OK, girls, which one of you wants it first? Ivan Milat was an outsider with a deeply ingrained contempt for the law. He also had little regard for other social niceties, especially when it came to women. Milat's pursuit of 16-year-old Karen Duck in 1975 was typical of his disdain for conventional values. When Ivan Milat first met Karen, who would later become his wife, she was six months pregnant by another man. It didn't really matter to Ivan. He thought, well, that was, you know, OK, as far as he was concerned. He didn't care whether he upset anybody. And there's no doubt about it, he did like women. And no woman was off limits for Ivan. Ivan Milat had no moral compass. He had relationships with the wives of two of his brothers. He had a relationship with Wally Malat's wife. He also had a very long relationship with Marilyn, Boris Malat's wife. And that spanned a number of years, possibly as long as 20 years. And during that time, she conceived his child. Much more disturbing than these affairs, was Malat's intimate relationship with his own sister. Ivan's incestuous relationship with his sister Shirley is said to have continued over about a 40-year period. Their relationship was so strong that I think you couldn't have been in the family without sort of scratching your head saying, what's going on here? While Ivan treated his illicit girlfriends with respect and affection, his marriage to Karen Duck was violent and abusive. 
I think Ivor Milat was a real Jekyll and Hyde character. He could be as nice as pie to some people and terrible to others. Certainly, as far as Karen's experience is concerned, uh, he was dreadful. He was a controlling man. He was uh, a, a monster in the way he treated her. But he could be incredibly kind, you know. Marilyn talked very kindly about uh, him, and they had uh, a very strong relationship, and she never saw that darker side of him at all. The former Mrs. Millat wept as she gave evidence for the prosecution. The ex-wife described him as gun crazy, a man who always carried a loaded pistol and would shoot at anything. His wife, Karen, spoke of uh, the incredible controlling violence that he exerted over her. It turned her into a nervous wreck. She was in such a state uh, with him when he was about to come home from work, she knew that there couldn't be a, a, a leaf sitting on the front lawn. She had to mow the front lawn. She had to have the house perfectly tidy, dinner ready, just how he liked it. Certainly, Ivan Milat would sexually abuse his wife, and he also would hit her, too. He felt the need to exert total control over her life. And I don't think this is entirely surprising, given what we know about him and what serial killers do, that the control is a huge part of the kick that they get. It's no surprise with Milat that every time he sustains emotional loss, typically through the breakdown of relationships with women, um, his killing starts. It's a means of emotional regulation. Uh, it's very typical with serial killers. Milat uses power, control and sex to get some equilibrium back. And specifically, we see that in 1971, way back when Karen Rowland was first killed. This was a particularly tumultuous year for Malat. His sister was killed in a car crash. His brother, Wally, was driving. And we know that affected Ivan Malat very significantly. So you can see how that could lead to him going out and finding his first victim. Ivan was quite close to his younger sister, Margaret. It may just be a coincidence, but it was just weeks after that that um, Karen Rowland uh, disappeared and was murdered in Canberra. Perhaps this is where things really did get started for him. Just a few months later, Marilyn Malat, his sister-in-law, ends their affair, so loss of another woman in his life. The best way to get back control was to control others. Marilyn certainly felt that there was a link between her breaking up with Ivan and him going off the rails. When she broke up with him in early 1971, it was only a matter of weeks before um, Greta and Margaret were attacked. Margaret Patterson and Margaret Pierce, or Greta as she became known, were two vulnerable young women. They met in Sydney while undergoing psychiatric treatment for being gay. The pair were hitchhiking to Melbourne when they were picked up by Ivan Malat on the Easter weekend. A few hours into the journey, uh, they noticed that suddenly they were on a gravel road. And uh, he pulled over and basically told them that he was going to have sex with them, whether they liked it or not. One of the girls asked him, have you done this before? And he said, yeah, I always come prepared. He tied them up with rope. 
He produced knives. He said, I'm going to slit your throat. I'm going to murder you. I'm going to kill you. And then one of the girls says, if I let you have sex with me, will you let us live? After Ivan had had his way with uh, one of the young women, they drove off again. Surprisingly, he then drove to a service station where he let them out. And they immediately reported it to the police. Ivan then went on the run and remained on the run for four years before he was eventually captured and um, sent to trial. I am very concerned in relation to him obtaining a fair trial. Despite their seemingly strong case, in court, Malat's lawyer, John Marsden, successfully challenged the credibility of the two naive young women, making great play of the fact they were gay. There was terrific bigotry in those days. Everyone was in the closet. The girls weren't particularly good witnesses. And the solicitor, John Marsden, who was acting for Ivan, was able to play up the angle that they had confused sexuality, which back in those days was still considered to be a psychiatric illness. Oh, well, he said that he expected to assault one of us or he was going to kill us. Ivan himself gave evidence about it and said that it was all voluntary. The girl he actually raped in her evidence made a sort of partial confession that as a result of the pressure that was being put on it, she had agreed to the rape. The jury certainly sided with Ivan, and they found him not guilty. It's, it's almost unbelievable when you look at it now. He beat the rape, and it was dishonest. And John Marston had a lot of guilt. He was gay and he had a lot of remorse until the day he died over his helping Malat at an early stage. It would have probably brought 10, 12, 14 year jail sentences. If he'd been in prison, his life would have been a different thing. He would have followed a different course. One thing is certain that Ivan learnt from that experience that showing mercy was only going to get you into trouble. And uh, perhaps it convinced him to take that, that next step. Coming up, face to face with a psychopath. There's something very odd about this guy. The daring escape. Run, Therese. And Malat's killing spree begins. He saw something and he wanted to kill him. It's the late 1970s, and Ivan Milat is free to roam the highways, hunting for new prey. In 1977, he abducts two more hitchhikers just south of Sydney, not far from where he picked up Margaret and Greta. My name's Therese Tran. I was a university student in Canberra back in the 70s. And I believe I was one of the lucky ones that escaped Ivan Malat. I was uh, a wild university student. Those days, everybody hitched. I used to hitch interstate, hitch between parties, hitch in the middle of the night, and it felt very safe. It was another one of those wild university weekends where this friend of mine, Mary, and I decided to go to Sydney for a party on the Saturday night. So we hitched up, had a wonderful time, and on the Sunday, we had to hitch back. 
we stood there for quite a while and eventually this car stopped and this guy said where are you going and we said oh, we need to hitch a ride to Canberra and he said that's fine hop in so we did Mary got in front and I got in the back So we drove for a while and the conversation revolved about various things like um, his love for shooting and guns and all that. Once he found out that I came from Vietnam, he was very focused on talking about war. Bombs, the shooting. Did you see people die? There was a real fascination about death and, and war. We got to Mittagong, went down the Hume Highway, and at one stage he took a right-hand turn, and it was tarred for a certain distance, then it became a dirt track road. At that stage, Mary said, where are you going? Well, you know, this isn't the road to Canberra. We're going, you should be going straight down the Hume Highway. So, no, 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 it's fine. Um, haven't you ever been to Canberra via this way? It's a very scenic route. I don't remember how long it took, but he turned left onto one of those, you know, the clearings where there are logs. And he stopped there. I do remember Mary turning around saying, what are you doing? You know, and he said, well, have to stop, Mother Nature calls. He opened the car, got out, at which point my friend turned around, she said, okay, there's something very odd, get ready. If anything happens, I'll just shout run and we just hit the ditch. He came back to the car and turned around and said, okay, girls, which one of you wants it first? He reached over to grab Mary around her shoulders, and she, being a much bigger girl than me, like quite strong, just went whack and said, run, Therese. And I, all I remember was just running down towards the ditch and then just hiding behind a bush. It's like as if everything slows down you're like an animal in the bush, just listening. Everything is heightened and you hear every sound. Barely breathing, just being like animals. You're being hunted, so that's how you behave. We did feel very scared. I heard the car starting and going towards the right and then stopping. And I was thinking, oh my God, you know, he's gonna go search for us. But he didn't. The car started again and the, the sound disappeared. So we went back to the highway. When we got to the highway, we thought, well, what are we going to do? We just still don't have the money to get back. So we had to hitch again, all the way back to Canberra. After that, neither of us hitched again. We just carried on with life as usual. Neither of us thought of reporting it. It was just considered to be, uh, you know, an unfortunate incident that happened in your life. And, you know, you don't, you don't think that you could possibly have been killed. I certainly didn't think, look, there's someone who's a serial killer. I really just forgot about it until 20 years later when the bodies were found in Belanglo State Forest. On the weekend, the bodies of Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters were found in bush graves near the New South Wales Southern Highlands. I think I, I was one of the lucky ones that got away. And in fact, when I had to go to the police station, one of the officers said, we believe 
you go to our practice run. So, you know, maybe I think we were. We were just lucky, incredibly lucky. Still to come is a predator. Horror in Belangelo. Milat wanted to control everybody. As Milat's murders escalate. Tied to a tree and used as target practice. Ivan Milat has let two more women slip through his grasp. But it's only a matter of time before he strikes again. His urge to rape and kill triggered by more emotional turmoil. The next big trauma in his life comes in 1987 in February when Karen Duck, his wife, leaves him. And it's later that same year in November that Peter Letter is murdered. There's a strong correlation, once again, between emotional loss, in this case, the breakdown of his marriage, and him then acting out by abducting and killing people, quite brutally. I mean, the nature of his abductions and the way that he kills these people clearly speaks to unbridled rage. When his marriage to Karen broke down, Ivan was shattered, absolutely shattered. All he could say is, I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. He said, I thought I treated her well, but I just can't believe it. He was just a very shattered, broken man. In this rare recording of Malat speaking from prison to his sister-in-law, Caroline, he reveals just how deeply it affected him. So, was it a particularly hard time in your life? Uh, traumatic, I suppose. It's like a death in the family, I suppose. That's how it, that's how it, it struck me, you know. It was sort of a loss. I, I loved her and uh, obviously she didn't love me or whatever. I had no idea. You know, I got surprised my life, so to speak. Karen ran out on Ivan on Valentine's Day 1987. He didn't react well to this. He, he, he went looking for her and was angry. About nine months later, uh, the first of the, the probable unsolved Alat murders of Peter Letcher occurred in November 1987. And then exactly one year after she left him on Valentine's Day 1988, he burnt down the garage of her parents. 1988, he's single again, so he resumes his affair with Marilyn Malat. Yes, his sister-in-law, although it didn't last that long, just a couple of years, and again ended in turmoil. That was just before the backpacker murders started, and Marilyn couldn't help thinking that uh, perhaps their relationship and the heartbreak of the breakup had contributed in some way. In July 1989, Karen Duck divorces Malat, and then later that year, in December, James Gibson and Deborah Everest are murdered. He's clearly escalating at this point. Uh, this time he has two victims. 1991, there's more killings. There's Diane Panaccio, who's abducted and murdered, Simone Schmidl, and murdered, and it's clear that his modus is now well established. Whenever he has a problem in his life, he seems to hit the road, abduct people and kill them. Later that same year in December, Anya Havshid and Gabor Nugabar were murdered. And in 1992, Joanne Walters and Caroline Clark were murdered. And again, a duo. They're hitchhiking, he takes them both, uh, and they're brutally murdered. Stabbed and one was shot 10 times in the head. The crimes are becoming ritualistic well entrenched, he's got his methodology down pat and he enjoys killing people and why not two? He can control them both, double the pleasure and uh, he can come back to the crime scene and save his evil when they're dead. 
brutally evil and destructive behaviour. There's an immense amount of rage shown in what he did to the victims. Uh, we did find four stab wounds uh, on the left side of the chest. And there's another one here, which is uh, very similar. And you can see, you can see the, the stab wound coming down this far, then the rest of the rib is just split from that. They were all uniformly stabbed around that spinal region. Uh, and that speaks of his desire to not just kill them, but to control them in a totally helpless state in those minutes before the life ebbed out of them. He's always been somebody who I think needs to be in control. Milat wanted to control everybody, and he clearly um, relished the control that he had over all the young people he came into contact with. This cloth uh, was around on the outside of his mouth, and you can see that it's in the form of a gag tied from behind, and, and it was this part that was around the outside of his mouth at the scene. The strange thing about Ivan Milat was that he, he really did overdo it when it came to the, the way he inflicted injuries on his victims. He used far more bullets than was necessary to kill people. He used far more stab wounds than was necessary to kill people. Now, why did he do that? Uh, did he want them to linger? Was this all part of the thrill that uh, he got uh, when he carried out his crimes? The terror that he inflicted on these people was just indescribable. And what they went through in their final minutes and seconds would have been hell on earth. He killed for no reason. But no reason at all with him, that. Random, randomly chosen young people walking down a highway. He wanted to kill them. I don't even think it was sexual gratification. I think it was having another person's life in his hand and stabbing them, but I can't work out why you would do it. He just saw people as moving objects and probably enjoyed their agony. It's the early 1990s, and Ivan Milat is at the height of his murder spree. In the sanctuary of his remote killing ground, he dispatches his victims with unspeakable cruelty. Milat's not only prolonging their suffering, savouring every last moment, he's also taking souvenirs. He might even have kept the skull of German backpacker Anya Hubschied after decapitating her. Police found a lot of souvenirs in Milat's possession. Uh, this is not uncommon. Serial killers, as you know, um, often take souvenirs for various reasons. He gathered together a vast array of material that belonged to the backpackers. Camping equipment, tents, mattresses, uh, cameras, money, foreign currency. And not only did he take them, but he then gave them to his family members. It's almost like he's He's challenging the police to figure out what he's done. Of all the souvenirs that he took, the most chilling was probably the Benetton top of Carolyn Clark. There was a photograph of Milat's girlfriend wearing a Benetton top, which was exactly the same as a photograph of Caroline, which is in our sitting room every day. Jolinda Hughes has stuck by Ivan Milat. Today, she was giving evidence about why at Milat's home, police found a photograph of her wearing a green and white Benetton top. We know that he took it and gave it to his girlfriend, Shalinda Hughes. Took a photo of her with that on. 
He's getting off on the fact that he gets to see his girlfriend wearing the jumper of a, a dead girl. That was one of the things that put him away. It was Caroline's contribution. What the family actually thought about these gifts, you can only wonder. It was, to say the least, a very unusual family. And what you can say is that with Ivan giving members of the family this much property, you'd think the family's got to be saying, thanks, that was very nice. But where did he get it? I'm mindful of that great expression. He killed it, and having killed for no reason, he couldn't live with it, so he stole from the dead body. Just as Malat's souvenirs provided crucial evidence in the Belangolo killings, belongings stolen from Diane Panaccio and Karen Rowland could link him to their murders too. Diane's gold chain, earrings and house keys were almost certainly souvenired by her killer. When they got Malat, that they did check his house for the necklace and keys, but nothing was found. In Karen's case, a bracelet bought at the Canberra show just hours before she died might provide a breakthrough. So these are the bracelets, similar to, to what you believe that Karen actually bought at, at the, the fair. fair. That's right. And she got it actually engraved at the show? It was, so engraved with Lynette. So this is a gift? A gift for... Lynette yep. Pomeroy, yep. Uh, and Lynette never never received the bracelet. It was never found in a vehicle. wasn't found at home. Potentially, the murderer uh, took that <clears throat> that item with them. It could be a souvenir, a memento. Uh, serial killers are known to do this, or it may have been given to somebody who is a friend or family. It may still be in their possession. And this might be something that triggers old memories in a context where they feel safe and how to speak about it. So basically, if somebody can identify this bracelet or a similar bracelet to this with Lynette engraved on it, that could be absolutely crucial to you. I think for, for us, that's our link to the past. Yeah. That is our key piece of evidence. Despite relentless pressure from her family, it's been decades since Karen's murder was actively investigated. But our reinvestigation of the case has finally forced the hand of federal police. In a carefully orchestrated operation, they recently returned to the crime scene at Fairbairn Pine Plantation to search for Karen's missing bracelet. We uh, recognise that it has been a long time, 50 years and we're now conducting uh, a search with equipment that was not available in the 1970s. The search uncovered nothing. But Steve Rowland hasn't given up hope. There is someone, or has been someone out there that took Karen and her baby's life. It just didn't happen. It wasn't something that happened on its own. And somebody, somebody somewhere does know. And that was what we'd really want to find out. Ivan Milat was a brazen serial killer. At least three times, he murdered two victims in one hit. Gabor Neugebauer and Anya Hamshi were murdered. Were found scattered through the Belanglo State Forest. It's one of the great mysteries of the Milat case. Two strong young people against one man doesn't add up. Did Milat work alone? Or was there a second killer? 
When searchers came upon the headless body of German Anya Habschied, it was covered with logs, so heavy it took more than three policemen to lift them. I'm, I'm in two minds, because I think Milat was a very powerful man. He was well armed with knives, revolvers, rope. When he was dealing with the girls, Caroline and Joanne, it was probably fairly easy for him so that leads one to think that maybe he was a solo. Ivan acted alone, and I've got no doubt in that. Ivan saw himself as the person in control, and he went about it in a way which gave him that control. When it came to actually exercising authority over them, he either pulled a gun or pulled a knife. If you want additional support that Ivan was on his own, you only have to look at the people that escaped Ivan. That is, the two girls in 1971 and the other Paul Onions. This English backpacker has identified Malat as the man who offered him a lift, drove him south along the Hume Highway, almost to the turnoff to the Belanglo State Forest, and pulled a gun on him. On both those occasions, Ivan was on his own. But then he had to deal with the German couple. And the young man was a big, hefty chap, six foot, five or six. And it's surprising that he took them on, unless he was just so cocksure of himself that he knew he could. How could one man overpower two people, particularly two young people who are quite strong? The answer to that, of course, was that he may well have got one of the parties to tie up the other party. And once the other party was tied up, then he could tie up the other person. We know that he attacked Paul Onions alone. We know that in the days after the disappearance of Anya Habschied and Gabor Neugebauer, that he had a, um, a bullet hole replaced in the front passenger seat of his car, as though he'd shot from the driver's seat through the hip region of whoever was sitting in the passenger seat and out the door. That speaks of somebody who is trying to control people from the driver's seat. I think the other thing that really supports the fact that he acted alone is that he gave family equipment that had been taken from the backpackers. And there was no suggestion from any member of the family that anyone else in the family had been a contributor to giving and sharing the backpacker equipment. Richard Millard denied telling the same workmate they hadn't found all the bodies. Look, all I can point to is that at the end of the trial, Justice David Hunt, he thought it was very likely that there was a second person. In his sentencing, Justice Hunt said he did not believe Malat had acted alone. In those cases where there were two backpackers who had been, been abducted, he thought there was a likelihood that there was a second person with Ivan to assist. And at one of the death scenes in the forest where Anya Habshid and Gabor Neugebauer had been murdered. There were two guns that had been used. So it was strongly suggestive of two people. You know, there's the possibility that whoever was the shooter might not have been Ivan, that Ivan might have been the stabber, and there was a shooter was somebody different, somebody who smoked cigarettes. Cigarettes and drink bottles were found at the scene of the crime, uh, quite near the bodies of James Gibson and uh, Deborah Everest, the, the two Australians. Two empty whiskey bottles and cigarette butts. Now, we know for certain that Ivan didn't smoke 
and he didn't drink either. Whoever shot Carolyn Clark was a smoker. There was a, a small circle of butts placed out on the ground near where the shells from the 22 were falling out of the gun. That does suggest that Ivan wasn't alone. Picking up two people and threatening them and overpowering them might well have intensified the experience for Ivan Milat, might have given him a greater sort of sadistic pleasure, if you like. It might well have given him greater scope for him to carry out his, his evil intent and to perform all manner of devious acts. What's your theory, Zath? Do you think he killed alone or was he with others? I think he acted alone. All of the evidence I've seen points to the fact that he acted alone. The intriguing question that flows from that, of course, is that cigarette butts and empty alcohol tins and bottles were found. He was known to be a non-drinker. So that raises a number of possibilities. Did he have an alternate ego? Like Jekyll and Hyde. So meticulous Ivan became careless drinking, smoking Ivan as part of his relaxation, as part of the ritual. Or was he more Machiavellian, leaving this evidence quite deliberately to put people off the scent? And the third option is actually that he got the victims to drink and smoke as part of his ritual behaviour. People wonder how he could have acted alone and controlled two people as victims. Uh, my answer is simple. Fear is a very powerful motivator, particularly if the person has a firearm. Oh, I agree. I think fear of a gun can certainly be a powerful reason to follow direction. So that also means that he could have been responsible for the murders of Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh. The theory about Ivan Milat, his name in our household was common, it was popular for the wrong reasons, it was often spoke about. My gut feeling, I've got an open mind and always have had. So it's hard for me to rule anything out. It's hard for me to believe anything. But my gut feeling back then made me sick. Criminal investigators Tim Watson Munro and Dr. Zanthi Mallet have unearthed five potential new victims of serial killer Ivan Milat. Now they've uncovered another strong case. It's one of the most intriguing cases that I've come across. The whole thing is just quite an extraordinary tale. There was a family from a little place called Cranback, which is around about two and a half hours north of Newcastle, who had decided to go to Colwarrick State Forest and search for some garden mulch for their home. And while they were collecting that garden mulch, they came across a human skull. The authorities were alerted to it and the crime scene was established. And over the course of the next couple of days, forensic police and detectives sifted through the dirt looking for the remains. It was fairly obvious from the start that police had a murder investigation on their hands. What was found at the scene was some jewellery, a lot of bangles, which initially pointed to police thinking that the body belonged to a young woman.
Unfortunately, the autopsy done by the pathologist in Sydney put this case back more than a decade. The pathologist found that the remains belonged to a young male, probably aged between 16 and 19, and probably of Asian descent. The leads really dried up very quickly. Ten years later, local detectives decided to revisit the case, requesting a fresh autopsy on the mysterious body in the bush. To everyone's disbelief, the pathologist came back and said the remains were that of a young female. Police were flabbergasted. Um, they'd lost ten years in the investigation, but at least now they thought they may finally get to the bottom of it. You can't find the murderer until you know who the victim is. So investigators went to an expert at Sydney University who was an expert in facial reconstruction and they actually were able to reconstruct the face from the skull found at the scene to give a picture of who this person might be. So the police were really excited, you know, they, they finally had a face that they could put out to the public and say, you know, who is this person? Um, but nobody came forward. It was another three years before local teenager Dylan Walsh started looking into the case and saw striking similarities to his missing aunt. Dylan went to his family and said, I might have found what happened to Auntie Susan. And they went straight to the police. And within a couple of weeks, had taken a DNA sample from Susan's mum. A few weeks after that, had finally confirmed that the remains belonged to Susan Eisenberg. Susan was last seen on the 2nd of October, 1986. She had spent the day celebrating her brother Robert's birthday before Robert had dropped Susan off outside the Stag and Hunter Hotel at Mayfield, but she did tell Robert that she was heading away and probably hitchhiking north. Her mother reported Susan missing a few days after she was last seen. They never ever gave up hope that Susan was still alive and that one day she would actually come home. For 17 years, they wondered what had happened to Susan. All of a sudden, they're told that Susan's remains had been in a box the entire time. Their hopes that she was coming back were obviously dashed, but now they had questions of what had happened to her and who was responsible for it. I've got mixed feelings. Um, part of me is angry. Uh, part of me is relieved. The cause of death was almost certain blows to the head. Obviously with the fractures to the skull. At least still unclear whether Susan would have been killed at the scene or whether she would have been killed somewhere else and then her body dumped. Susan's body was found in Kowarik State Forest in a place, although only a few hundred metres from the Pacific Highway, if you knew the area um, and wanted to discard a body, it was a good place to do so. It didn't appear that there was any gravesite. The body had been just discarded. A name that continued to crop up in 2003 and 4 was Ivan Milat. Susan Eisenhood was known to hitchhike. She was actually probably going to hitchhike that day north. Ivan Milat was known to have worked in the Newcastle area in the 70s and the 80s as part of road gangs. And there was also anecdotal evidence that he'd worked further north towards Taree, where Susan's body was found. The case of Susan Eisenhood takes the tally of likely Milat victims to six. The disappearance and murder of Susan Eisenhood bears many similarities to the MO of Ivan Milat. 
She disappears off a major arterial road, the Pacific Highway, proximal to Newcastle, and she's found in dense forest. Very similar, obviously, to Belangelo. And we also know that there were a number of pieces of jewellery that were found scattered among her remains, which were distributed around the forest. But what we don't know is if anything was actually taken as a memento. We know Milat is working in the area. He's driving up and down the Pacific Highway, a marauding serial killer. He sees a vulnerable hitchhiker. He picks her up, he kills her, and he dumps her close to the highway. But it's not long after that that he finds a much more convenient killing field much closer to home. Coming up, the veil is finally lifted on Belangelo. It's like having x-ray vision. In the hunt for fresh burial sites. You can oh. actually mm -hmm. see potential areas for a search. Two weeks ago, Dr. Yuri Shendrick scanned Belangelo State Forest, looking for sites where Ivor Milat could have hidden other bodies. He searched two 15 hectare zones using laser technology called LIDAR. The data has now been processed into a 3D image of the forest. This is the data that we collected, and this is site number one, which was scanned uh, using a LiDAR sensor. So you can see this level of detail colored in different colors. Basically red colors, higher elevation, blue and green colors, lower elevation. With any other uh, imaging technology, you can't really get that level of detail. That's why LiDAR is really powerful. Site 1 was identified as a high priority for scanning because it's at the far end of a fire trail, one of Malat's favoured killing zones. What we're actually looking for are where you have the major fire trails. Malat used those for vehicle access to get the victims in. He then wanted a smaller trail um, to get off that main track and then a, a clearing. And those are the kind of sites that he was targeting so he could spend time with his victims as well as going back later. Right, so this is one of the main benefits of LIDAR. You can actually remove a uh, whole of vegetation and see what's happening underneath. You can see terrain and all the bombs and pits in very high detail. And that's what we were able to capture with LiDAR very, very nicely. You can actually see um, all the trails that are known and possibly not known that uh, are potential areas for a search. It's like having X-ray vision, really. Exactly. It's amazing technology. Yeah, so here you can see site number two, which is roughly the same size. And again, it's heavily vegetated site and with a main trail. The second scan site is close to where Caroline Clark and Joanne Walter's bodies were found. Is that a fire trail or a walking trail there? So this is a fire trail uh, which you can access by car and that's exactly how we got to the site. If you follow this trail, you can oh. actually Look. see oh, it's another one. those tiny trails that extend from the main one, which you can only access on foot. Yeah, and you would never see that through this exactly. bush Exactly. Look cover. how dense it is. Yeah. If I were to direct people to check certain spots, those would be probably the high priority areas, those trails that go off the main track. And actually then, when you get a break in the canopy, you can actually see that. So we've got the, the walking trail, and then here we appear to have an open area. There you go. Yes, it's a flat area, and that's probably a good stopover. Yeah. I would definitely prioritise those kind of areas for search. Both site scans reveal unusual depressions in the terrain and hidden clearings 
that could be fresh killing fields for Ivan Milat. He would have walked along this trail here, down to here, an open area, killed his victims, and then had time to sit back and savour his brutality. Could Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh be here as well? These cutting edge images of Belangolo Forest will now be sent to New South Wales Police. It could be the breakthrough needed to solve this case. Still to come, the serial killer turned celebrity. He liked being a star. Wielding his power until the very end. That was Malat still being in control. And a final twist. There are other Ivan Malats out there. When Ivan Milat was arrested for killing the seven backpackers, his notoriety earned him a twisted celebrity status around the world. Police in Australia. Polizei hat in einem the murder of seven backpackers, including two British girls. I've never met anyone like Ivan Milat. He just didn't respond like other humans. High profile criminal lawyer Chris Murphy saw firsthand how Milat reveled in his newfound infamy. He was arrested for his murders on the 22nd of May, 1994. On the 29th of May, 1994, he sent a message for me to go out and see him. I had the largest criminal practice in New South Wales, probably Australia at the time. We got calls all the time to visit people in jail. He'd asked for me, and it was out of extreme curiosity that I wanted to meet Ivan Milat. I've been involved in hundreds of homicides, but I've never dealt with a person who's killed for no reason. I sat in the visitor's waiting room. Came walking down the hall. Like a string puppet with his arms jangling. And I could pick that prison persona, usually associated with long-time inmates who have some sort of status. And he had a status of his own in that jail as a homicidal maniac. But he was a bit proud of who he was. I could sense that. Young prisoners would whisper and look, there's Ivan Milat. He liked being a star among prisoners. What an odd claim. What an odd claim to a position in life or achievement that you move into a world of people who do bad things and you're at the top of the tree. The first thing I noticed with Ivan Milat is that there was no emotional response to stimuli in conversation. If I told you a joke, you might laugh. He just sat there until I laughed. If I said this was serious, you might frown. But unless I frowned as well, he didn't frown. He just wasn't responding. He just didn't know how to behave as a human. He said, I would like you to represent me. I said, well, I don't think I want to do that. I've represented thousands of people. I have appeared for members of parliament and movie stars, celebrities and beggars. I've been in practice since 1972, and I've fought with the full fibre of my being for everyone who's been wrongly charged. Ivan Milat was hopelessly guilty of a series of shocking homicides. I couldn't overcome anything in myself 
that could ever let me use my powers in a situation like that. And I couldn't live with myself if I got Ivan Milad off. Milad spent 23 years in prison for the backpacker murders. Despite the mountain of evidence against him, he refused to confess. A lot of people who are clearly guilty of horrendous crimes maintain their innocence to the end. One of the most common reasons is to maintain credibility with the few people who are still supporting them out in the real world. So in Ivan's case, it was members of his family. And I think in order to maintain credibility with them, he maintained his innocence to the end. Malat exposed one small chink in his armour when he was compared to the notorious underworld killer, Neddy Smith. Malat was walking past a group of prisoners and one said to him, who's killed more people, you or Neddy Smith? And he said, we could have a good weekend away hunting together. He was a serial killer without morality or care. And he had a persona. And in an odd, smug way, in the devil's playground, he clung to it. He also reportedly divulged his secrets to his mother when she was dying. When Margaret Malat went to visit her son, she knew she didn't have long to go, and she went to visit him in Supermax. And uh, she came out looking a bit shaken, and one of her younger sons, George, asked her what was wrong. Had she been told something she didn't want to hear? And she said yes. George said to her, did he say anything to you? What did he say? Did he say that he'd done it? And Margaret said, yes, he did, or words to that effect. And that was the only time, if it's true, that was the only time that Ivan Malak confessed to his guilt. He wasn't so forthcoming with police. They tried desperately to extract confessions about all his suspected victims, including missing girls Tony Kavanagh and Kay Doherty. The detectives that were on our case, they'd actually gone to Goulburn Jail. They told me that he was the most conniving, cunning, biggest liar they had ever spoke to. Even when Malat was days away from dying in 2019, he continued to wield power over police and the victims' families. Some people thought that Ivan Malat might confess on his deathbed, but that never happened. It never happened. And the police made numerous visits to his deathbed in hospital and in the prison wing at the uh, Long Bay Jail. He was only days away from uh, succumbing to cancer. And he would always say, I know nothing about it, mate. You can hold a blowtorch to my eyes and I'm not gonna say anything. So he was determined not to give anything away at all or to admit any kind of guilt. I think that was Malat still being in control in his own mind. Um, that, you know, he'd got a secret that everybody else wanted and he wasn't going to tell anybody. I think uh, Ivan maintained his innocence right to the end because he thought he was still in charge. He still possessed stuff that you wanted. I think he saw that as a way of maintaining the fact in his mind that he was the boss, he was in control. It's the great question of law, mad or bad. Do we mark him evil or insane? He certainly was not a tiger that you'd want loose in the public arena. The evidence in the Belangolo killings was overwhelming. But the infamous name of Ivan Malat has now been linked to more than 20 other murders right up the east coast of Australia.
Malat was a highway killer. He was marauding and cruising up and down the Hume Highway, abducting and killing people. We suspect also that he was driving up and down the Pacific Highway and killing people as well. From Canberra, the nation's capital, to far north Queensland, it's a frightening roll call of unsolved deaths and disappearances dating back to the early 1970s. There have been a lot of backpackers who have disappeared without trace. A fair number of those backpackers were probably also his victims. Over the past year, Tim Watson Munro and Dr Xanthi Mallet have been working to discover just how many of these young hitchhikers were victims of Australia's most notorious serial killer. People were vanishing then, people were being killed, but it just wasn't on the news as much. Nobody joined the dots, but he had a free hand at it for a fair while. Time, indifference and incompetence have meant the trail has gone cold in some of the cases. Michelle Pope and Stephen Lapthorne. We just don't know enough about these two to rule them in strongly, so I think we need to put them aside. And place and circumstance have ruled out others. I also don't think Mlatt's responsible for Robin Hoyneville Bertram or Anita Cunningham in North Queensland because it's just too far out of his hunting zone. That leaves six strong possibilities. Let's take a look at our shortlist. Yep, I think we should start with Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh. Schoolgirls Kay Doherty and Tony Kavanagh went missing from the south coast town of Warilla in 1979. It was right here at this bus stop, opposite the Warilla Grove shopping centre, and Malat was known to be working in this area at the time. This is literally the last place they were ever seen alive. Yes, they disappeared. More than 40 years later, their bodies have not been found. I knew something wasn't right. And I knew I wasn't going to see my twin sister again. I really knew that. Mm. So in terms of why we have included them in our shortlist, they fit the victim profile and they are within the geographical range of Belangelo. Um, however, without the deposition site, and really that is Malat's MO, isn't it? It's all about that deposition site and what he, what he does with his victims at those locations. So I don't think we can rule them out, but they're not the strongest likely Malat victims for me. Well, having reviewed all the evidence, I agree with you. So I think we should next consider Susan Eisenhood. 22-year-old Susan Eisenhood went missing from Newcastle in 1986. The body was found in a forest two hours north along the Pacific Highway. The cause of death was almost certain blows to the head. It didn't appear that there was any gravesite. The body had been just discarded. Malad, he's an obvious suspect and an obvious strong suspect to this day. In my view, a much stronger example of Malat. Uh, the modus operandi fits with his. She's found in dense forest off a major arterial highway, the Pacific Highway, in a shallow grave. I would definitely rule her in as a Malat victim. Certainly, although she's probably not at the top of the list for me. For that, we should look at Peter Letcher. Peter Letcher was murdered in 1987 just before the Belangelo killings began. It did have similarities to the backpackers. He'd been stabbed in the back, he'd been shot in the head. They were 22 bullets. Exactly like seven bodies that we found in the Belangelo forest. This one's hard to go past. In my view, a very strong case. I think Malat definitely did it. The evidence points to him, the gun casings, the modus operandi, and his hitchhiking along a major arterial highway, which was the Great Western Highway, uh, prior to being murdered. Yeah, for me, ever since I started looking at Malat, I've always considered him the eighth Malat victim. I'm also sure that Malat is responsible for Peter's death. 
Next individual we have to consider is Diane Panaccio. Diane Panaccio went missing in 1991 during Malat's Belangolo killing spree. She was 29 years old and had a two-year-old son. So this is the last place she was seen alive. She's vulnerable, she's on her own. For a predator, that's mm. ideal. They located the remains under a tree stump and covered in pine needles. We told that she was strangled and stabbed. Again, a very strong likelihood that it's Malat. She disappears in Bungendore. Uh, it's suggested that uh, Malat was drinking at the Bungendore Hotel when she was there. He was known to be working in the area at the time. And of course, the deposition sites are virtually identical uh, to the others. Yeah, I hadn't really considered Diane Panaccio as a likely Malat victim until we went actually out to the scene. For me, I think Diane Panaccio has to be right up there as a likely Malat victim. Then, of course, there's Karen Rowland. Karen Rowland was just 20 and five months pregnant when she was abducted and murdered in Canberra back in 1971. Witnesses suggest they've seen a dark-coloured car, a young girl running from the car. Is there any chance that that was Ivan Malat's car? I can give a lot of reasons as to why it could be him. Uh, I can't find an answer as to why it, it isn't him. Tell me why it can't be Ivan Milat. From the very beginning, I was very sure that she was a victim of Milat, probably his first victim. The modus operandi, I, I think it was an opportunistic crime. The deposition site, identical really to Belangelo. She's strangled, and uh, I think that uh, that's where he started to get the lust to kill others. Yep, totally agree. I've been working with the Roland family for probably a couple of years now to try and move the case forward, and I really think that if we hadn't gone down this route to reinvestigate it, then the AFP may not be looking at it now. So that's a really positive step forward, and I genuinely believe that this case could now be solved. I do too. But what of the other victims along Australia's east coast whose deaths and disappearances remain shrouded in mystery? All of these are less likely to be Malat's victims, which means there's another serial killer out there. Or several, so someone else could have been preying on young, vulnerable backpackers in the 70s and 80s. Maybe you could argue that Ivan Malat wasn't a very good serial killer because he got caught. I, I suspect that most of them don't. I think that we were a bit naive in thinking that Ivan Malat was a one-off case. If you look at the statistics, there were backpackers disappearing at fairly regular intervals. And my own view is that there are other Ivan Malats out there. Ivan Malat's murders left at least seven families forever fractured. And the repercussions of his crimes continue to reverberate around the world. The number of people who were affected by these crimes would go into hundreds. Not just the parents and the close relatives of the victims, but friends of the victims. Ivan Malat's actions had affected hundreds of lives, if not thousands of lives. Tim and Xanthi believe the new evidence uncovered during their 12-month investigation will help the six victims' families, who are simply seeking justice. So what we should do now is take all of the information that we've collated and present that to police. 
These cases are potentially solvable. Yep, and after all these years, these families deserve answers. The impact on the family has been immense. I don't know of many other detectives that have known murder victims within their own family and it tends to hone what you do a lot more when you realize the impact murder has. Yes, we all say the words murder, homicide, whatever you want to say, but it is the loss of a life, and that's what's tragic here. There were two lives that were lost that day. To have your loved one disappear and then turn up murdered like that and never have an answer as to who did it, You'd crave justice. Justice is all you've got to hope for. You don't think about it. Like life just goes on. And then the 7th of April come up, a birthday, and then it plays on your mind. Just different little things, but the not knowing, just that to know that person or persons to get their part of justice. And pay their dues. That's why we're doing this. I don't think a day went by that uh, Susan's mum didn't think about what had happened to her daughter. Her mum was devastated when she first reported Susan missing and that feeling never left her for the 17 years before Susan was identified and it hasn't left her for the 18 years after. You can't sit across from people who have lost their children and not feel the immense weight of the what they've gone through. And But for all of us looking on, it is still just like a sad movie. You can never fully experience what they experience. Feeling that feeling every single time they wake up in the morning and remember who they are and what's happened to their lives. It absolutely ripped the heart and soul out of my mum. I said, Mum, I promise you, I'm going to do everything in my power to find answers. Closure would be the main thing that we're looking for. We need to know why and how. That's the, the, the hardest part of all, is the not knowing. I feel a sort of a long-term concern that we haven't been able to offer a solution. And that does stick with you. But for the loved ones of these six victims, it is never too late for justice. If there's no conviction, if there's no accountability, families suffer. They can never really put it to rest. There are so many cold cases that may be attributable to NLAP. And these are the forgotten victims, the forgotten families. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. You yeah, want